Hi, this is Dave Davies of the Kinks. Hey, I'm Nick DiMatteo, and welcome to Season 6, Episode 10 of Music Is Not A Genre, MXG. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening. Quick note, if you are a watcher, hello, you can see my set, my lovely set. Don't forget, you can stream this everywhere, just the audio of it. And if you're just listening, go to YouTube.com slash at Music Is Not A Genre, and there is a video for every single episode which let's get to this episode right now. The title of this episode is What's an Album and Why? Part 2, Coming of Age in the 1960s. So if you were listening closely there, you noticed I said the words Part 2. And that's because this is the second part of a multi-part series in which I am going through the history of albums decade by decade. But it's been a while since that first episode. That was back in season five, and a lot of things came between there. Not to mention, I realized that researching albums of the 60s was daunting, so I kept putting it off, but this felt like the right time. So in order to kind of refresh your memory and get you caught up into where we are with this series, this is part two, uh, let me tell you what happened in the first episode. We went through the history of albums uh, entirely. And I have a, you know, a playlist on YouTube for this that I'll just be adding to, you know, the more I do these episodes. So you should be able to fairly easily find or get to part one of my album series and you'll get to hear or see the full history of where albums came from and all of that stuff dating back to the somewhere in the 1800s, I believe. And then I went through albums in the 1950s. There were way fewer albums then. So uh, that's why I kind of lumped that together with the general history of the origin story of albums. And uh, that and it was, yeah, it wasn't the heyday of this format. 78 records were still prominent uh, really through, I think, the well, they, they were at least uh, sold through the end of that decade, and then they were discontinued. Uh, 45s were the big sellers, and keep that in mind, because uh, if you are generous enough to be a Patreon member, you get the bonus episode for this episode, which is going to be on the history of 45s. Uh, and... I'm kind of excited about that because I've been a 45 collector for a while. I guess you could say, I don't know what that means. I, I stopped buying 45s a long time ago. I'm not sure what I'm saying, except that when I started buying music, I started with 45s. And so the bonus episode, it kind of means a lot to me. So anyway, the 1960s uh, is when the, the firm establishment of the vinyl album uh, as the dominant form happened. The dominant form of musical artistic expression. Eventually, by the end of that decade, all artists embraced it in one way or another. And if you're just, if you are watching, if you're just listening, what you're missing out on is, are two uh, vinyl behind me that kind of represent the span of what was popular in the 1960s. Of course, it's not everything. Uh, there's a lot more I'm going to go over, but it, it's kind of, uh, it, important that you note that. And if you look at my graphic, you see from the from 1960 to 1969 how the best-selling albums changed through that decade and how music itself changed. So that's something to keep in mind. Album sales started to peak in the middle of this decade and would remain strong, believe it or not, through the early 2000s. And then when streaming came, that all kind of fell apart. Uh, and I don't mean just vinyl, just so you know. Vinyl is is where albums originated. You could say, well, that's not, actually. The albums happened before then. If you look, listen to part one or watch part one, you'll, you'll get that. But it's what we think of as an album. We often think of as the 33 and a third vinyl. But when I talk about albums, I'm talking about the art form and not the physical object, because the physical object means a whole lot less to me than the art itself. Uh, many of the iconic albums, and a high percentage on any best ever list, come from the 1960s. Very few came before, which shows you how really, like I say in the subtitle, albums came of age in the 1960s. Was it the most dominant uh, decade for albums? No, that that's still yet to come. But it was the decade when, again, they came of age. They became something to be uh, dealt with. Uh, and why? <clears throat> well, 
we're going to talk about that. Most albums from this era were still a collection of singles and album tracks and were meant more commercial to easy packaging to sell a bunch of songs from one artist uh, than they were artistic. But the further development of the concept album and of honestly just thinking of an album as more than just a collection of tracks, but as a carefully curated sequence of songs, a collection of songs, its true birth as an artistic consideration. That's what happened in this decade. Yes, there were people thinking about that in the 1950s, but globally and, and as far as artists across all genres are concerned, it, it really took hold in the 1960s. And again, I will say more about this in part three, whenever that happens in the 1970s, which was the height of all that. What I'm going to focus on for this episode uh, is the best-selling albums of each decade, notable albums of each decade, trends for each decade, some other notes that I'll go over from 1960 every year through 1969. And, and then, uh, like I said, the bonus video is on the 45, which was the actual best-selling format of the 1960s. The 45 it was cheaper, so it was easier to you know buy a bunch of them. And you'll hear a lot about that in the bonus episode. Go to patreon.com slash music is not a genre, and you can watch that video. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a video. That's, that's me, my face on it. So let's get to the meat of this. Right off the bat, 1960. Uh, the late 1950s and early 1960s were kind of a weird time uh, in music. Uh, it, they were an in-between time when that initial surge of rock and roll was fading and rock becoming a dominant form hadn't happened yet. There were many people uh, who claimed, uh, as would happen in every decade really, that rock and roll was dead. After, you know, Elvis went to the military and all, you know, the scandal, Jerry Lee Lewis, such a bunch of things happened. And I think uh, uh, little Richard quit and, and all of that. Those things happen. And then the day the music died with Buddy Holly and, and Richie Valens and the Big Bopper dying in the plane crash. So that sort of signal to so, you know, a perceived death knell of rock and roll. So you had a lot of vocal groups and folk groups and, and easy listening and jazz and jazz vocals and, and all that were still a very big thing around the late 50s, early 60s, up until, of course, uh, 63, 64, when uh, rock and roll started to surge again, which we'll get to. Uh, there were there was a lot of jazz, a lot of jazz. It, it, to me, it's the greatest period for jazz. I mean, every every era has great jazz, including today. Listen to Robert Glasper, and you'll know what I'm talking about. He's got a new Christmas album coming out. I'm very excited about that. But the for me, the 1950s and and most of the 60s were a real sweet spot for jazz. It's when it was still somewhat commercial, but exploring its artistry and had some grounding and foundation, but w was expanding in ways that were becoming mind-blowing. You had people like Ornette Coleman, Wes Montgomery, Jerry Mulligan, Art Pepper, Miles Davis, Charles Mingus, Eric Dolphy, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk. You had jazz vocalists like Sinatra with Nice and Easy, Ella Fitzgerald, Mel Torme, one of my personal favorites, and you had some holdovers from the first rock era in 1960, like uh, Chuck Berry, who released an album. He continued to release albums almost almost up to his death. Uh, and Elvis was still releasing music. And, of course, the album in 1960, one of them was uh, G.I. Blues. And he also released his first gospel album, His Hand in Mine. He released the album Elvis is Back, one of, I guess, many comebacks for Elvis. Uh, there was soul music like Ray Charles. There was folk and folk rock like the Everly Brothers, who released two albums in 1960. I'm going to talk about the frequency of album releases a little bit later on in this episode. And uh, Joan Baez, her eponymous debut solo album, she was on an album before this, but in 1960, her solo album came out. I honestly didn't know that she was recording that early. I was associate her with, you know, Woodstock and, and that era, the hippie era. But she was around long before that. Kingston Trio, three of their albums in 1960 went to number one. Uh, and musical theater, check what's behind me if you can't see it. Uh, it's the soundtrack to West Side Story. I'm going to get to that soon, but I put that there partly because I don't have a lot of 1960s albums, but also because musical theater was a dominant form 
in the 1960s. Uh, the top album of 1960 was the cast recording of The Sound of Music. So that's the stage version of The Sound of Music, not the, not the movie that would come later. The cast recording of The Sound of Music was the top-selling album of 1960. You also had a lot of easy listening, like Billy Vaughn, uh, There's a Summer Place, and you also had uh, some comedy albums, which I talked a little bit about in the first episode. Uh, Bob Newhart w was big then, and I think, was it the button-down mine? I don't know if that was 1960, but look it up. That was something that did hit the charts. That was on the top, uh, you know, I believe... A lot of what I'm mentioning, other than the jazz artists, which notable, very notable, uh, I'm mentioning a lot of the ones that went to number one during that calendar year. 1961 was very similar to 1960, especially in that, again, the best-selling album of the year was a musical, which was Camelot in this case. Uh, also, the cast recording of Carnival was also big. There was a lot more easy listening, like Lawrence Welk and Burt Kempfert. Uh, movie soundtracks went to number one. Now, of course, that would happen through the decades. But again, this was an era when it would it would happen more frequently, when people were really listening to that kind of music in droves. Uh, vocalists were also very popular. Uh, Judy Garland, in particular, had an album out in 1961. Elvis, again, had three albums chart. And uh, I'm almost getting to the point where I'm talking about, you know, how it is that a, an artist could release three albums in one year when we are so not used to that these days. There was a lot more jazz like Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Eric Dolphy, Art Blakey, Max Roach, Ornette Coleman, Ella Fitzgerald, Dave Brubeck. Classical music was on the charts as well. Uh, there was more soul and blues like Ray Charles. Aretha Franklin's debut happened in 1961. John Lee Hooker released an album in 1961, and there was some folk in 1961. So some slight changes there from 1960, but largely the same, largely the same. In 1962, I'll say it again, the best-selling album of this year, third year in a row, was a musical, and it's the one behind me. It's West Side Story, which I think still ranks as my top favorite. It's definitely top five. There are some others, Avenue Q, things like that, Les Mis. But uh, this was a big one. It was a big one in my family. My dad starred in this, uh, in his college production, and uh, I've done songs from that. So West Side Story was pretty big for me. Uh, there were a lot more soundtracks and easy listening in 1962, uh, like the soundtrack The Breakfast at Tiffany's uh, and uh, Mitch Miller, easy listening, you know, orchestral dude. Uh, 1962 saw the release of Ray Charles' iconic and genre-busting modern sounds in country and Western music, which I haven't listened to Ray Charles' discography yet, or chronography, as I like to say, but I, I, I do plan to do that, and I'm pretty excited to listen to this album in particular. Uh, more folk, like Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, were very big that year, and Bob Dylan's first album came out in 1962. Uh, more comedy albums hit the charts, like Alan Sherman, Vaughn Meter with his first family, where he was uh, mimicking the Kennedys and all that stuff. That was a huge, huge, huge hit. Everybody at that time knew that album, one way or another. 1962, you know, we know what happened after. So a real, real pivotal uh, time here. Uh, lots more jazz and soul, uh, including Stevie Wonder's debut, that teen uh, sensation, Stevie Wonder, and his second album also came out in 1960s. Two albums. Uh, rock and roll was creeping back. Wasn't quite back chart-wise yet, but it was creeping back. The Beach Boys debut album, Surf and Safari, came out in 1962. It's always interesting to me as somebody who did not experience all of this firsthand that, you know, the Beatles being dominant and continuing to be dominant decades later uh, which I've got a pod fast coming up that'll talk a little bit about uh, their their current dominance, that they were, had existed certainly prior to their big uh, American debut in 1964, but that the Beach Boys were already a sensation by the time they got here. You know, Beach Boys in a lot of people's minds when you think of the Beatles are kind of also ran, but rands, but you have to remember how huge they were. And 62 was their debut, Surf and Safari. Uh, we start to see more African-American artists make more of a chart impact 
and more of an artistic impact outside of jazz and blues and and soul they would they would you know infiltrate the pop charts and the rock charts and this is important because I talked about this a few seasons back where I said all music is black music and I might have had a qualifier there of a deck of a date you know but uh, I, I'm pretty much stand by that that any music that we hear today that uh, was created in the last hundred years at least is somehow comes from black music culture so it's it's kind of important and it's not that um african american artists didn't hit the charts before 1962 or whatever and 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 all of that you had chuck berry and little richard and so many others and uh you know jazz artists ella fitzgerald and sarah vaughn and you know forget it you know in that in the realm and ray charles that we as we talked about but it's this decade when you started to see more of a surge of that now that surge would continue to be super slow as far as sales and especially as far as people getting their due uh both uh, artistically but especially financially it would take decades for all that to develop but you know the 60s were important and that really starting to take hold 1963 again top selling albums west side story it was a sensation what, what what could i say i mean it was a huge sensation it's something it's something to remember and to keep in mind more comedy albums were released that year that hit the charts um more easy listening vocalists uh like andy williams and frank fontaine uh, there were more albums from Stevie Wonder and Peter, Paul, and Mary. There were tons more jazz. I tried to find a jazz vinyl in my collection, and the only ones I had were either from the 1950s or well beyond the 1960s, so that didn't work. Uh, and, of course, 1963 uh, sees the release of the Beatles' debut album, Please Please Me, and uh, then also following that up with the Beatles in 1963. Now, these were the British albums. And just a quick note, I am clearly, and this tends to be the case with all of my episodes, unless it's something specific, I, I am kind of a Western music centric and uh, in particular America, a little bit Canada, UK certainly. And that is certainly the case here with vinyl. If there's someone out there that knows a lot about uh, albums of the 1960s and their dominance in other countries, especially non-English speaking countries, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know more about that. But just so you know, that's what my focus is here. And, and that's 1963 debut Beatles album in the UK. Uh, Beach Boys released three albums in 1963. Bob Dylan released Freewheelin' Bob Dylan in 1963. Lots more soul music. It, there was really a ton of it by this point, and that would continue to grow even before Motown was a big thing. Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, James Brown, and Rufus Thomas all released albums in 1963. 1963 also saw the debut album by Barbara Streisand, who as of this recording just released the tome. A memoir, I guess it, it is. Uh, so, you know, she's still out there doing some great stuff. And this is when things, you know, everything's gradual. I think I've said this uh, quote before, and I think it was attributed to Ernest Hemingway, but who knows if uh, he was the original, that uh, change happens gradually and then all at once or something like that. And that's certainly the case with music where you're seeing things starting to dominate the charts that had been around for years or been in development for years, but the consciousness of it, where people know about it to a point where it's not just uh, dominant artistically or dominant commercially, but then it's dominant in their minds. It becomes part of the culture and the zeitgeist. I know I use that word a lot. Uh, that's that whole all at once idea. So all of these things were bubbling up gradually, but the all at onceness would happen seemingly in the following year, 1964. Uh, now, here's an interesting tidbit, though, and this is why uh, I am, you know, I created that graphic for this to show how you would expect 1960s. So everything in the graphic would be rock and roll. No, because everything in the charts was not rock and roll. Not by far not by a long shot rock and roll would not dominate this decade really commercially at all until the very very latter years uh 
A uh, perfect example, one of the number one albums of 1964 was uh, The Singing Nun. I remember being told that was a sensation. I honestly uh, did not do a lot of research on why or where it came from, but look up The Singing Nun. I think you'll be fascinated with the history of it. This, of course, was also the year of the advent of the Beatles albums in the United States. Three albums came out, the U.S. Uh, albums, Meet the Beatles, The Beatles' second album, and A Hard Day's Night. So huge, uh, and, and anybody who knows music history knows 1964 was huge for the Beatles and for the British Invasion and for rock and roll in general, the resurgence. There were also three albums from the Rolling Stones in 1964 and the Kinks' debut album in 1964. So there's that British Invasion, there's rock and roll taking hold. Of course, the Stones and the Kinks wouldn't be quite as dominant in the U.S. until maybe the year after or the year after that, but they, they were out there. But again... So 1960, 61, 62, 63, best-selling albums of every year were a musical. 1964, also, again, the best-selling album is a musical. It's Hello, Dolly. So this is, I can't, I can't really stress how important it is. It's why my graphic starts with the pictures of two musical uh, album covers. Th it was, they were huge. And sure, they're huge now. We know that. But it was a different thing then where they were huge in chart dominance, in, in musical appreciation, all of that stuff. Uh, 1964, more folk music like uh, uh, Bob Dylan released more. Uh, Holy Modal Rounders, Joan Baez, Phil Oaks. There was more soul. Otis Redding, The Drifters, Aretha Franklin, and Ray Charles. So a real mix of a year. And even though the British invasion happened, again, rock music did not dominate the charts in, in, in really any significant way. But it did make an impact and kind of a, a, you know, a splash in the culture in a significant way and would continue to grow through the decade. 1965, again, three Beatles albums. Beatles 65. Uh, now, I'm listing four Beatles albums because some were U.S., some were U.K., and I talked about that in my Beatles series, which if you don't know it, go to YouTube.com slash music is not a genre, uh, and you will find, or is it, no, slash at music is not a genre, sorry, YouTube.com slash at music is not a genre, and you'll find uh, when I talk about the Beatles uh, history through nine, I think it's nine episodes now, I make mention of the difference between the U.S. and the U.K. releases. So behind me, you see Beatles 65, which was one of my dad's albums. Uh, that was released, of course, in 65. Beatles 6, VI, Roman numeral 6, was another U.S. album. And Rubber Soul and Help were both released in 1965. Uh, but, of course, it's 65, rock music. It's the 60s, so there's bound to be a change in the number one album. I mean, 1960 through 64, the number one album was a musical. So, of course, 1965 hits, and the number one album is again a musical. It's Mary Poppins. So, for those of you scoring, six years in a row, the number one album was a musical in the 1960s. Uh, I didn't look up what the number one album was in 58 or 59, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was also the case then. Uh, also, the Sound of Music movie soundtrack was one of the number one albums of the year as well as the album to the movie Goldfinger. Uh, Herb Alpert's Tijuana Brass came out that year. Uh, more jazz. Again, more jazz. There's jazz every year. Wayne Shorter and Andrew Hill, Herbie Hancock. Now, what you're hearing are names which start to seem more like the future of jazz as opposed to, and, and you heard that a little bit with Miles Davis and all that, or the, the presence of jazz in the 60s, but these are people like Herbie Hancock wouldn't super dominate until the 70s and 80s, and you're hearing these jazz artists really branch out, getting into more avant-garde jazz and things like that in the 60s, which is significant because that was what was happening in other forms of music as well by 1965. 65 also saw the debut uh, uh, album by The Birds, and Dylan's album, Bringing It All Back Home, and Highway 61 Revisited, so two albums for Dylan, and the debut of one of my favorite bands, The Who. Their debut album came out in 1965. Also, the debut of by the band Them, which was Van Morrison's original band. 
uh, G-L-O-R-I-A and all of that stuff. So we're here, middle of the decade, which I think is the perfect time to take a break. We've got a few more years to go and some conclusions and a featured song and, and talk about the bonus episode and, of course, questions for you. So uh, go, you know, get some coffee, which is what I'm going to do, or or just uh, sit and watch or listen to my wonderful promo, which happens in the middle of every episode, and we will be right back. Hey, so I was going to do the usual and just list all of the links that I'd love for you to check out, but I realized that everything you need to know and everywhere you need to go is at nickdomadio.com. That really is the hub. I list all the links in every episode just in case, but nickdomadio.com is where I put everything that I do. If you want to know more about this podcast, whether it's the audio version or the YouTube version at youtube.com slash at music is not a genre or wherever else the podcast shows up, or if you want to support the podcast at patreon.com slash music is not a genre just go to nickdomadio.com it's all there if you want to check out my full discography of original music and covers for my band rec rec and beyond it's at nickdomadio.com including all the streaming and social links for wherever you listen to music and wherever you check out your social uh, my acting clips are there my voiceover clips are there graphic design my blog and most especially it's the best place to contact me if you go to nickdomadio.com slash contact or just hit the contact is on every single page you can send me a note say hello ask me any questions you'd like you get a newsletter a few times a month and if you have a project of your own and need work done for it whether it's audio editing or music or voiceover or graphic design or if you have an event and you need live music go to nickdomadio.com contact me say hello let me know what you need i'd love to hear from you Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. We are back, and we're going to get right into it. We've made it past the middle of the decade, really. We're getting into 1966 as we start to see these you know, significant changes happen in, in the culture. Again, just to remind you, uh, rock and roll was not really dominant uh, for most of this decade. But again, in 1966, again, three Beatles albums came out. Rubber Soul, Yesterday and Today, and Revolver. Now, I know I mentioned Rubber Soul back here, didn't I? Yeah, in 1965. I think that's because, uh, I don't know, it's either a misprint or different uh, release dates for the U.S. and the U.K. But uh, we know 1966 is a pretty significant year for the Beatles either way. And, of course, Yesterday and Today was the U.S. album. Uh, and uh, Rubber Soul Revolver were, uh, yeah. So anyway, Revolver was right around the time when the Beatles were saying, "Please don't release different versions of our albums." In you know that, and and that would that would take hold in 1967. Uh, also, the 66, the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds, which is arguably the first modern era concept album. Now, I talked about concept albums uh, in the first episode, and that's because. They started to really, when you think about it, in the 1950s uh, with, uh, believe it or not, Frank Sinatra. There was a folk artist as well. I forget. I think Woody Guthrie maybe. Uh, but there were people who were doing concept albums back then. But they didn't, they, they weren't quite the same as what we think of as a concept album today. Although I do really enjoy that idea of a concept album of just connected songs. The Pet Sounds really was when it kicked off. It's what inspired Sgt. Pepper's and so many others. And again, concept albums would not be dominant in the 1960s. Uh, that would, Their heyday would be the 70s. But this is this is huge. This is huge for this. Uh, Mamas and the Papas debut album came, back, came out in 1966. Uh, check out my interview with the author of the book, Scott Shea. Uh, the book on Mamas and the Papas. Uh, that was a great episode. Great talk. The Monkees' debut album came out in 1966. Cream's debut album in 1966. Mothers of Invention's debut album, that's Frank Zappa's band. Freak Out in 1966. Jefferson Airplane's debut album in 1966. So with those, 66, uh, Mothers of Invention, Jefferson Airplane, you see why I made mention of the fact that jazz was starting to branch out into more avant-garde territories in 1965. Jazz is one of those uh, genres that tends to be ahead of others, uh, or at least it was for many decades. So then the following year, you start to see more artists like 
the the Beach Boys with the slight wildness of things on Pet Sounds, Mothers of Invention, Jefferson Airplane, more experimental music, more psychedelic music happening. San Francisco was a burgeoning scene then, and that would continue to grow and grow and grow and has influenced music straight up until today. I, I think uh, it's important to note, and I'm sure I've mentioned this in previous episodes, how significant uh, psychedelic and experimental and progressive music became for pop and rock and other forms of music we don't even associate with those genres in subsequent decades, which means that the development of concept albums and experimental and psychedelic music and, and free jazz and avant-garde and all that stuff was super significant because that's where it, it all started. Dylan's Blonde on Blonde came out in 1966. Simon and Garfunkel, uh, two albums came out. Not their first. They released an album prior in 1964 that tanked. And that wasn't their first as a group. Their first uh, were singles uh, under the name Tom and Jerry. But <clears throat> their first actual successful albums came out in 1966. Two albums in 1966 by Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, the Supremes A Go Go. And by this time, Motown had been going strong. It was the first album by an all-female group to reach number one on the charts. The Supremes of Go-Go in 1966 was the first album by an all-female group to reach number one. But, and the bestseller for 1966 was not a musical. Was not a musical. It was also not rock and roll. It was uh, by Herb Alpert's Tijuana Brass, which Herb Alpert, by the way, still around, had a big hit in the 80s, actually, and has, you know, contributed some significant music through the decades. Uh, so it's somebody to look up because it's not somebody most people know. And he's got this kind of cool laid back style that goes beyond easy listening in my book and is a great producer in many ways. So his album Whipped Cream and Other Delights was the best selling album of 1966. Uh, if you look at the graphic, whether you're watching or listening, the graphic for this episode features that as the third of four albums because it was a kind of a pivot point. It was when, uh, you know, musical theater didn't have quite the hold that it had. It doesn't mean it wouldn't come back uh, or wouldn't, you know, be on the charts sometime in every decade. I mean, think of Grease, think of Les Mis and Phantom, et cetera, et cetera. Think of Rent, think of uh, Avenue Q, I don't know, Wicked. Uh, so it's been around and will continue to be around. But uh, this is when its hold wasn't as strong. And no, this is not a rock and roll album, but Herb Albert was considered semi-counterculture at the time. And if you look at the album cover, you can understand why. And still more jazz, still more soul, still lots, of, and actually lots of classical. Uh, you know, as recording technology improved, even though classical recording had been around since really the advent, the advent of recorded music, it would grow in leaps by leaps and bounds when the 33 and a third, uh, you know, came in because it allowed for more time on one side of a recording. Uh, when you think of 78s and what kind of an al an album 78s were, again, listen to part one. You had a stack of of discs for just for one album. How can you do a full movement, classically speaking? when you're breaking it up into four-minute chunks. So 1967, again, pretty significant changes here. Two Beatles albums released in 1967, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and uh, Magical Mystery Tour. When we do our Beatles uh, show, and I don't mean just gigs, I mean the show show where there's a script and everything, one of the lines is the London Times said Sgt. Pepper's uh, was... Um, like a, a definitive uh, for the West moment in the history of Western civilization or something like that. And we still talk about it. And no, it wasn't the start of concept albums, but it was the start uh, to me uh, of other bands considering them viable in both artistically and commercially. And the, one of the points being, and you'll hear this in my podcast a couple weeks from now, when I talk more about Beatles music is that, even though there were many cases in which the Beatles did not actually innovate music or, or start a certain kind of music, them doing it, A, they do it well. 
whatever it was, whether, you know, whether it was experimental or heavy metal or power pop or, you know, folk, whatever. But B, them doing it kind of validated it for the rest of the world in many ways and spurred other artists to do the same thing. And I'm sure the Beatles would be the first people to give credit to artists who did it before they did it. But let's let's be honest, their impact for, you know, integrating the, the, the different kinds of music into what they did was, su was super significant and still is. Three Monkeys albums were released that year. More of the Monkeys, which number one album of the year. So I do call the Monkeys the rock and roll music. And of course, they were pop as well. So maybe power pop. I don't know. But and I respect them more than, you know, you might think. Uh, I am not the kind of person who says the Monkeys were better than the Beatles. That's a contrarian. But I will say that the Monkees uh, did significant music and did good music many, many years beyond what we remember, maybe. The, they had the top album of 1967, so they rank uh, as the first, I believe, uh, yeah, as the first number one album of the year, chart-wise, sales-wise, 1967, to be rock and roll. So, you know, which you may make sense. They're more palatable, you know, than other rock and roll acts. So easier to, you know, for the masses to love. Uh, they also released Headquarters, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones Limited. So those are the three Monkees albums. Jimi Hendrix debut in 1967, Are You Experienced? More Beach Boys came out. The Bee Gees' first international album, which watch my episode or listen to it on the uh, on the Bee Gees. It's, uh, it's one of my most popular episodes of Music Is Not a Genre. A lot of great Bee Gees fans out there who understand that they were always more than disco. And, you know, this wasn't their first album but it was their first international album, and it was a hit. It was a big hit. The Doors' debut and second album came out in 1967. Velvet Underground's debut in 1967. Sly and the Family Stone's debut this year. Uh, very clearly, very clearly, 67 was the year that rock and roll finally took hold of the charts. That, in fact, the only non-rock number one album of the year, album to go number one at some point, was the number one album of the year, Herb Alpert's uh, Whipped Cream and Other Delights. Every other number one album was a rock and roll album. Uh, how You know, whatever genres of rock and roll existed at the time. So you had seven years of the decade, 60 through 66, when rock was really not that dominant, creeping up, but not. it, it would take until 1967 for it to dominate the charts. Also in 1967, you had a lot of blues and soul and folk folk rock you had the birds you had buffalo springfield they were huge that year the beatles 1968 again this time they'd only released one album that year uh the white album which is one of my favorites uh you know if you haven't listened to it it's double album you know it'll blow you away and was ironically very significant regarding album art because there were no pictures. I was white. That's why it's called the White Album. And there was a stamp of their name. So the actual name of the album is The Beatles. They were really going kind of bare bones. And they were making kind of a an artistic statement by being anti-artistic in that way, which I absolutely love. I've done it for some of the things that I've done. Uh, but up to this point, you didn't have like there would it was around the middle of the decade when artists start to consider the album cover as a work of art in its own right. It's not that there weren't considerations about album covers prior to then. I mean, part of it is just for sales. You had to put the just the right picture to, and the right mood and atmosphere of, you know, Frank Sinatra leaning on a table or whatever it is, you know, to get the message across of what the album contained and to, and to entice people to buy it. But that's a little different to me than... Again, the album art itself being a concept. And you had Rubber Soul and Revolve, Revolver really starting to bring that idea up. And, and other artists were doing it at the time, too. Certainly psychedelic artists. But it was really Sgt. Pepper's that, that threw it you know, down. And the White Album in its, in its anti-way saying the same thing. That the album cover is significant beyond its commercial uh, merits. 
Uh, Cream and The Doors both had number one albums in 1968, something that would never have happened in years before. The Rascals and Big Brother and the Holding Company also had number one albums in 1968. Jimi Hendrix, number one album, final album, Electric Ladyland in 1968. There was more Simon and Garfunkel. There was also more easy listening like Herb Alpert and Paul Moriart, I believe. I had never heard of him until I did the research for this. <clears throat> Blood, Sweat, and Tears debut album in 1968, uh, the year prior to Chicago. Fleetwood Mac's debut album in 1968. This was when they did not sound like the Fleetwood Mac that uh, we know. They're more blues-based. Beach Boys and the Birds were still going strong in 1968. Procol Harum's Shine On Brightly was uh, released this year, and I think... It's, I think it's the first progressive rock album to make an impact. No reason to claim it was the first progressive rock album ever. I haven't done an episode strictly on progressive rock. I, I think I will at some point. Uh, but So I haven't done the research. But really as far as charts, as far as the culture beyond musicians and music, Proko Ham Shine On Brightly, I think was the first prog rock, rock album to make an impact. Uh, the band's debut album, which shows that you had this uh, period in rock where it was either rock getting raunchy and hard, think of the Stones, think of the Kinks, think of them, or rock getting more, uh, you know, poppy like early Beatles or the Monkees or, uh, you know, some of the other uh, British invasion bands, etc. Or rock getting more experimental and psychedelic and, uh, you know, intending to really push buttons and, and push the envelope. And then all of that started to, uh, I mean, that would continue. But there were a lot of artists who were saying, can we get back to our roots? The Beatles did it to a significant degree on the White Album and certainly beyond that. And then the band, who was Dylan's backing band and Robbie Robertson and all them, I think LeVon Helm, whatever, were, this was huge in 68 that an album like this would hit the charts because it, it wasn't the kind of music that you would associate with rock and roll. It was very rootsy. And let's remember that folk music had been chart dominant for at least since the 1950s and probably even before then. And so you had folk and folk pop and folk rock and all of that happening, but that was considered in its own realm, a different realm. But then you had the band and other artists starting to bring that into mainstream rock and roll. Uh, more psychedelic and experimental, uh, were, which were becoming hugely prominent by 68, of course. Lots more jazz and soul. Uh, and lots more folk and country like Glenn Campbell, huge that year. And let's get to the final uh, year of this decade, 1969, the best-selling album of the year, which you may want to say, you may want to say, and I don't know this for sure, but I think it's probably true that even though 1967 saw the first year when a rock and roll album was the best-seller for the year, it was the monkeys. And fine, I'm not disparaging them. But when you're talking about like actual, when you listen to the music in today's world, it still sounds like rock and roll with an edge. You'd have to go with 1969's Iron Butterfly in Agata de Vida, which was the best selling album of the year and the last one on my graphic to show the transition from 1960 through 69 and all what happened in between. And so to me, that means that it took until the final year of the decade for a, a straight up true rock and roll album by a rock and roll band to dominate the charts. But go back and review the 1960s with that in mind and see what else you can discover. 1969 saw the debut albums of Chicago, Chicago Transit Authority, double album, absolutely incredible. Led Zeppelin's debut and second album, both came out in 1969. It's notable that though the Beatles albums all went to number one at some point, as we're coming to the close of their their era, none were the best-selling albums of any year. I mean, they're they're at the top of the best-selling charts now, but within their actual year, none best were the best-selling albums. Through 1969, White Album was still in the charts. Abbey Road was also on the charts. And let's make a, a note of this. 1969, you had that, you know, or whatever, 1968, the White Album. 
the Beatles would start like most artists who had uh, done albums uh, in years prior, in, in the decade prior even, releasing three albums a year, three albums a year, then two albums a year. And so many artists would do this, even even artists you wouldn't think of releasing that many, like Dylan, you know, would release a couple of albums usually in a year. And then, of course, our artists like Elvis and Frank Sinatra. And, and to, in today's world, we think of an artist releasing an album at most once a year, usually once every two to four years. That was not the case then. So again, hugely significant decade for albums because when they started to rise in prominence artistically, it was important that artists took their time to craft them as opposed to just throwing a bunch of songs together and trying to come up with three albums in a year, unless that was how prolific they were. So by 1969, there were very few artists in most genres releasing that many albums in a year, although that would continue to happen. So when you look at a discography of... I don't know, Willie Nelson or Dolly Parton or whatever, you you wonder how the hell is it that they have like 70 albums or whatever it is when, when they weren't even, you know, I mean, maybe Willie's been working that many year, decades but or years. But, uh, you know, it, it, it goes over the amount of decades that they performed. That's because they would release multiple albums in a year. 1969, The Stones Let It Bleed, The Who's Tommy, so huge, huge. Uh, after a few years break of no musical reaching number one on the chart at all, Hair does. It's not the number one of the year, but it's, it is uh, significant in that musicals return, but they return morphed. They return in the rock era. So you would have Jesus Christ Superstar and others coming out like that. Hair was huge in 1969. So, and that was kind of an important change in, in the world of musicals. Lots more roots and folk. You had Nick Drake. You had Creedence Clearwater Revival. You had, again, the band. You had Fairport Convention. You had lots more jazz, uh, avant, experimental, free jazz, uh, and also experimental music in general, like Zappa and Captain Beefheart. Now, you're not, you're not necessarily going to hear uh, an artist named Captain Beefheart in 1960. And again, that just shows the uh, significant changes that happened. Because when you think about it, yes, there were significant changes in music to come. Uh, electronic and hip hop are, are the two big ones and, and all the subgenres and, and uh, even heavy metal, I think, would be considered somewhat big as far as a, a shift in music. But the majority of what would be considered the musical vocabulary was established by the end of the 1960s. You can't discount what was going to happen in the next decade, and I'm excited to get to part three when that happens. But just, you know, our musical language was really, uh, went from, you know, proto to, uh, I don't know, let's say proto-Indo-European to Old English, I don't know, in the 1960s. It was a language all its own that was much more fully formed. So some conclusions... Uh, again, noticing the big shift from the beginning to the end of the decade, how rock and roll was ex existent in the early parts only by people who were vestiges uh, of their success, like Chuck Berry and Elvis, not to take away artistically. Uh, and musicals, easy listening and soundtracks were much more dominant. And then rock and roll and uh, became hugely dominant in the 19, by the end of the decade. Soul and R&B and funk slowly rose to prominence through this decade, though they wouldn't dominate the charts the way they would in the 1970s and beyond. And and beyond. And when if you know anything about recent charts, you know that the the bubbling under of all this stuff that was happening significantly in the 60s uh, was nothing compared to what would happen after that. Jazz was present in some form or another throughout the entire decade in a very significant way. It was no longer the the chart had the chart dominance that it did in the 50s or when you think of big bands in the 40s and and somewhat in the 30s, but it was there and there in very significant ways. Uh, and again, conclusion, even though artists like Sinatra had embraced the concept album idea, it didn't really take hold to the mid-late 1960s and would take another several years to blow up and then implode uh how uh, along with that uh, you know artists concept or not started to take the album uh, as a work of art seriously including the, the album covers uh 
In fact, if you didn't take care to craft and sequence your album by the end of the decade, you were considered out of it, uh, considered kind of old hat, you know. Uh, if And yeah, we talked about the frequency of albums released by the end of the decade, you know, maybe one album a year. Uh, though folk and social commentary had been around prior to the 1960s, that's absolutely true when you think of Woody Guthrie and people like that. And so many of the blues artists and, and jazz artists and, uh, you know, Strange Fruit and all that. Many artists were having artistic breakthroughs in the early part of this decade with social commentary music like Dylan. But as far as the charts and the social, uh, you know, aspect and the culture, the second half of the decade saw music as a thing become super important in the language of society and culture and politics. And that was largely due not just to the changes in music in general, but to the, but to the fact of the album becoming the dominant form of art. And yet, don't forget, it wasn't the biggest selling form. That was the 45. And if you go to patreon.com slash music is not a genre, you can hear my, listen to my, watch my bonus episode on the 45 and the history of that. Uh, my faves of the album, of course, the British Invasion bands, uh, Beatles, The Who, The Kinks, The Stones, in that order. Those are my top four. Go back and listen to that. A part of my favorite era of jazz was the 1960s. In fact, the only albums I prior to the 1960s I listened to all the way through are probably jazz albums, to be honest. Uh, as much as I respect and know music before the 1960s, this is when my true influence begins. Speaking of, featured song for this episode is from uh, when I was going under the, the artist name Nick, all caps, from the album Listen You People. It's the opening track, Naked. And to me, this sounds like a 1960s-influenced songs. The lyrics are about emotional nakedness, but let's get real. It's called Naked, so clearly there was a double meaning there. So I thought this was pretty significant in terms of uh, this decade of music. And that was a time when I was doing music that was more kind of straight ahead rock with that kind of 1960s influence. Uh, so there's going to be a link. Stay tuned. You will hear the song Naked at the end of this episode. And uh, let me know if you think it sounds uh, like it's a 1960s or 60s influenced song. I think, I think you probably will agree. Uh, this song was featured on the local station when it was still doing rock in Philly, WYSP. It's now its sports station. It was one of the huge rock stations at the time. When it came out, it was played after the Rolling Stones played in, their, in the arena in Philadelphia. The radio station came on and my song came on because they were doing like a best of local music show. Again, one more note. Uh, this episode will conclude very soon with the featured song, but please go to patreon.com slash music is not a genre if you want to see the bonus episode on 45s, on singles. Questions, what are your favorite albums of the 1960s? What are your favorite albums? Do you feel like this was the heyday of albums or was that yet to come? I want to know everything that you're thinking and feeling about this episode and beyond because as always, my objective is here, a music conversation and connection. Thank you as always for watching and listening and I will talk to you next week. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Coming down on me
and sympathy She says you can't do that to yourself You just gotta let it be Like it when she opens